This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Pauline Schuckmark, Jr., host for We Like the 1%, which is on every Thursday at 11 a.m. for a couple of months. My guest again today is Dr. Yaron Brook, chairman of the Ayn Rand Institute and host of the Yaron Brook Show. Aloha, Yaron. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs> I'm glad we were able to get you in again today. Um, yeah. Now, yeah. yesterday on Outside In, uh, we gave an introduction to Ayn Rand and her work. Uh, and we're going to go a little bit further with this idea that she emphasizes in most of her fiction and nonfiction, which is the individual versus the collective. Yeah. And um, now you're the author, you're an author yourself, you've written quite a few books, and the one most relevant to what we're discussing today is Equal is Unfair. So, Yaron, could you explain to us why you wrote this book? Well, I wrote the book because the whole issue of inequality was becoming such a big deal. Everybody was talking about it, and it was blamed, inequality, the gap between the poor and the rich, was being blamed for every problem we have in the world. It was being blamed for the inability of the poor to rise up from poverty. It was being blamed for cronyism. It was being blamed for mediocre economic growth around the world. It was even blamed for global warming and terrorism. So every problem in the world, and it was, and still is unfortunately, being blamed on economic inequality. And that struck me as just wrong but worse than wrong, morally offensive. Because at the end of the day, economic inequality is a consequence, it is a feature of political and economic freedom. When we are free, we're going to be unequal. It's only when we're not free can you try to create some kind of equality of outcome. And one of the reasons Ayn Rand writes about this quite a lot, either through her fictional characters or in her philosophy, is because she came from Russia, right? Originally she was uh, from Russia. And she oh. came to America and she saw a vast difference. Isn't there a vast difference, you're on, between the system she came from and what she experienced in America? I mean, she, she grew up under communism, so she experienced communism firsthand. She knew how brutal how uh, uh, poverty-stricken, how offensive, how anti-life communism was. And she became communism's most significant enemy. Uh, you know, she not only uh, tore down both the moral and philosophical foundation of communism, but built intellectually a philosophical foundation for capitalism, the exact opposite of communism. So yes, Ayn Rand knew of what she spoke and and she thought and she was she thought communism was an evil ideology uh, and uh, evil in practice and evil in theory and she fought against this against this ideology her whole life. And she was very very impressed by what she experienced in America and what she learned about America when she was still in school. How did she come to be so inspired by American thought? She took a class when she was a teenager, I believe, wasn't she? In uh, a class, but my understanding is the primary means by which she was inspired by America was from the movies. I she think. loved American movies. Yeah. And when she could see in an American movie the skyline of New York skyscrapers, uh, people dressed up in beautiful clothes, uh, beautiful buildings, cars, and she is in poverty-stricken communist Soviet Union. I mean, the, it was obvious that the immense gap between the two cultures, between the two, uh, you know, uh, uh, worlds, really. And she was first and foremost impressed with a British character when she was in her youth, was she not? Uh, so the influence is Anglo-American on Rand's work, basically, and her thoughts. Yes, very much so. I mean, she was influenced, she was also influenced by the French. I mean, she loved Victor Hugo, 
Uh, she was a huge, huge proponent of Victor Hugo's literature, but she was inspired by romantic literature. And she loved the, the, the heroic. She, she was also inspired, for example, by a, a Viking story from Scandinavia. So anything heroic, she loved, she was inspired by. Her whole motivation, she says in her literature, is to portray the ideal man. The, you know, so, so somebody heroic who is using their own free will in pursuit of their own values and, and willing to overcome any kind of obstacles in their way. And one of the results of the American system is obviously something that's driven by entrepreneurship. That's why America became so successful, it became very powerful, because people were left alone. Um, the, the Federal Reserve only came about about 100 years ago. So uh, before that, people were left alone to thrive uh, with fairly little regulation, if any at all. So it was Wild West, literally. And the Americans weren't the first, actually, to do this kind of experiment. The Florentine Republic uh, was actually composed of entrepreneurs. They were not interested in um, equality. They were interested in maintaining status. They were elitists. But anybody, there was social mobility, so anybody uh, among the entrepreneurs in Florence could apply to become part of the Tre Maggiore. So it wasn't, uh, it was really the first time you saw, that was the Italian Renaissance period, uh, that you had this kind of um, activity, that there weren't career politicians, there were entrepreneurs, businessmen who were running the government. Yes, and, and look, it, it, and at the end of the day, the American political system is anti-equality of outcome, but it is pro-political equality. So part of the innovation of the Founding Fathers is to create a system, and this is what capitalism is, that protects the individual rights and that treats all individuals equally in terms of their rights, in terms of their freedoms, in terms of uh, their ability to live their life free of coercion, free of force but that otherwise leaves them alone. It doesn't try to equate them in terms of outcomes or even in terms of opportunities. It sets up the rule of law. It treats everybody the same under the rule of law, equal before the law, and otherwise leaves people alone. Yeah, otherwise it's fair game. So yes. the race starts and there are a few people at the finish line first. And yes. it's not fair to take the trophy away from them, isn't that correct? It, it, it's, it's, it's morally offensive to take away somebody's achievements from them. Uh, somebody works hard, they produce, they create, they build, and as a consequence, they make a lot of money. It's theirs. The money didn't exist before. It's not ha ha reallocated to them. It's new value that is being created. It's new wealth that is being created. And it belongs to the person who created it. In, in this case, whether they are an entrepreneur, whether they're an artist, or whether they're a, uh, uh, you know, an athlete, whatever the mechanism by which they have generated this wealth, it is theirs. And it's none of anybody else's business to try to equate it and to take it away from them and to give it to somebody else. That's all wrong. So where do you think um, this sort of business about it's not fair came from after the recession. You started this narrative about the victim. You started snowflakes, safe spaces, sob stories, this victim narrative that these people up at the top, and th this show is we like the 1%, so the super rich are really 0. .000, I think it's seven zeros and a one. That's yeah. the super rich. These are the elite billionaire class, which out of seven and a half billion people, there are approximately 2,500 billionaires. And most of them are just barely hanging on around one billion. They just made it to the mark. So yeah. the, the Gates, the Buffets, the, the Zuckerbergs are very, very rare indeed. Um, but it, it's not the point that Bill Gates has, for example, uh, what is it now, about 80 billion. Um, it's he decides what he does with that. Right? It's not it's anybody else. He created it. Yeah. He made it. He built it. And, it. and and a lot of the resentment towards, I think, the Bill Gates of the world is twofold. One is people who just don't understand how anybody could be that productive. 
could be that creative, could produce as much as Bill Gates indeed has produced. So I think that's one source of the resentment towards Bill Gates. How could anybody create so much wealth? That's impossible. And the second source of the resentment is envy. Yes. People hating Bill Gates because he's been successful, because yeah. he created, because he produced. So it's two different sources, but generally, it is it, 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 one is a rationalization for another. So for the most part, people hate the wealthy because they resent their success. They are envious. Yes. And then they excuse it by creating a rationalization. You didn't build that. <laughs> you didn't earn that, to quote, uh, to quote uh, President Obama. And uh, there's a saying here in Hawaii that um, if somebody is trying, it's the crabs in the bucket metaphor yes. that they, they're very fond of here, where if the cra one clever crab is trying to climb out of the bucket, all the losers at the bottom try to drag them down. And um, while that's funny in a way, I, I think it's quite sick, actually. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. It's uh, immoral. It's evil. It, it, it's, it's a culture... You know, this is why the crabs are stuck at the bottom of the bucket. Bucket. It's a way to institutionalize poverty and to secure everybody at the bottom. So the only way you can standardize everybody to be equal is equally bad, equally poor, equally pathetic, equally at the bottom. And, uh, and, it, it, and, it, and that's what every system that tries to establish equality, that's what it generates at the end of the day. And in many ways, this, this behavior is done because actually most people are capable of doing something creative and producing something of very great value. Uh, most entrepreneurs, they're not particularly highly intelligent. It's just down to character and drive, is it not? And when they see somebody who's actually done something, that envy strikes them. And it's almost as if they have to tear that person down because they don't want that other possibility of them having had a chance at that to, to happen. They don't want that possibility to exist. I think that's right. But I think that they're envious of somebody who, who has good character. They're envious of people who, have, who are smarter than them. They're envious of anybody who's better in some dimension or another. Envy is the hatred of the good for being the good. That's how Ayn Rand defined it. Hate, envy is the emotion that wants to knock stuff down. It's the emotion geared towards hatred. Hatred of everything, hatred of life, hatred of existence. And it, it is, unfortunately, an emotion that very many people have. It, it, it reinforces, it, it feeds off of their insecurities. So right. what, what they try to do to conceal this envy, this, ver this very nasty part of the human character, uh, is they start playing the victim, isn't that correct? They start blaming other elements or other variables Two for their things. situation. They claim that you didn't build it, that you didn't do anything to actually justify uh, your success. So they claim that your success is unjust and, and, and not worthy and, um, and, and, and wrong. And, and then they try, so that's one way, you know, you're not that smart. Or the other way is to say, you're just lucky. Bill Gates is just lucky. He just happened to be in the right place at the right time with the right pro you know, everything's luck. I, I think there is. So they, what yeah. they want to do is they want to disassociate the success yes. from you. And then they can tell people, see, she's got billions, but she didn't build it. She just got lucky. And if it's just luck, then now you start having a good excuse to take the money away from you. Yeah, I think luck does does play a role to a certain extent, uh, because I think it's a combination of factors, because a lot of people do try their hand at entrepreneurship, and a lot of businesses do fail, but people have the courage to try. And I think it is a combination of three factors. There is the hard work, uh, there is the interpersonal skills, you have to be good with people, and I think there is an element of luck, because even Napoleon said, uh, when he was picking his marshals, uh, he said, ah, but is he lucky? So there is an element there that some people have more luck than others, don't you think? I mean, that might be possible, but um, I think it's also true that people create their own luck. People yes. place themselves in positions where good things happen to them. They are prepared when good things happen to jump on them. They are ready. They are focused. They are, they are uh, you know, so they're really mentally prepared 
for taking advantage of opportunities. And I think that's what luck is at the end of the day. Yes, it might be a little bit different on a battlefield, but generally I agree with you. And people do create their own luck. You have to do a lot of calculation, a lot of planning. And I think uh, it's the same on a battlefield. I, I think, yes, it, you know, there's a certain element of luck, but to the extent that you're prepared, you're lucky. Okay. That it's the more you're prepared on a battlefield, the more, uh, the less luck plays a role in it. Yeah, great. Okay, so we're going to take a quick break. We are on, and uh, we'll be back uh, in a moment. Thank you. Oh, hi guys. It's RV Kelly. I'm your host of Out of the Comfort Zone, where I find cool people with cool solutions to problems that all of us face. Now, the thing is, we're really cool. And I only invite really cool people, but the thing is, I think you're kind of cool too, so I think you should come and watch. That Thursdays at 11 a.m. here on OC16 Television with Think Tech Hawaii. I'm RB Kelly, host of Out of the Comfort Zone, and I will see you next Thursday. I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? They told me they were making music. Aloha, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to We Like the 1%. Aloha, you're on. We're back after that break. And I just want to start talking about this funny business about um, wishy-washy lefty things happening on US campuses, which always strike me as a bit odd. Uh, now, some reporters, I've noticed on certain YouTube clips and other places, reporters go around and ask students. They say, what is it that you want? What are you, what are, what are you complaining about? And the thing I've picked up that seems to repeat itself quite a bit is a student saying, they don't care. So I'm wondering who the they are. I mean, is this this white privilege thing that's very trendy now? Uh, who is the they? Is this just a way of deflecting responsibility from themselves when they could make something out of themselves and they're blaming somebody else for their failures? Or what is it? Yes, I mean, it's what we call it in the 60s and 70s, the man doesn't care, right? Mm -hmm. uh, nobody cares about them. These are, these are spoiled little brats <laughs> whose mothers have been hovering over them their entire life. And suddenly they're expected to make decisions for themselves. And suddenly they might fail a class. And suddenly they have to go out and find a job for themselves. And they have to find a place to live. And they actually have to live a life for themselves. And they don't know what to do. And the conclusion from all of this is people don't care about them. And because is this taking care of does them. this stem from the fact that there's too much choice or too much freedom in America, it confuses people. So you're getting a lot it's of arrested too development. Too little choices and too little freedom. Hmm. No, I mean, that has nothing to do with that. This is all about the fact that these kids um, are not trained. We have a public education system that is just horrific. They're not trained to think. And if you can't think, you're finished. I mean, if you can't think, if you don't have the capacity to be to be to use your rational mind to you know think about your circumstances to solve problems then you're basically left to emotions well i mean somebody somebody emotions are not going to lead you anywhere but to say oh my god what am i going to do life sucks <laughs> well That's it. a lot of a lot of people who are highly intelligent also happen to be very lazy so is laziness an al also a factor in this well, I think laziness is, again, a symptom of people who are not using their minds, a, a symptom of people who have not been trained and have chosen not to be engaged, not to use their mind. We talked yesterday about the essence of Ayn Rand's morality. The essence of Ayn Rand's morality is focus, engage with the world, use your mind, don't be lazy, mentally, be completely active. That's what that's what morality is about, being mentally active. So laziness in that sense, mental laziness, is a vice, according to Ayn Rand. Yes, and based on all this, in a country as free as America, 
and it's relatively free. We don't have an example of a perfect country that has a perfect free market, but it's the closest thing possible. Um, should there be 48 million people on welfare? I mean, does that make sense? Uh, no, there should be zero people on welfare. I think that's true of every country. I, I think welfare is, is immoral. I think welfare is immoral for two reasons. One, it's taking my money and somebody else gets to decide what to do with it. That's wrong. That's stealing, right? Yeah. I should decide. If I want to help somebody out, if somebody's struggling, if somebody needs welfare, I can give to charity and I can help them out that way. But nobody has a right to steal my money and give it to somebody else. But also, when we hand people checks, when we hand people welfare, we are institutionalizing them into poverty. We're basically telling them, you're worthless. They'll never find a job. Here's a check from the government. Don't worry, be happy. Of course, they can be happy because they can never tame self-esteem, which to a large extent comes from our jobs and our work, and they have no incentive to go find work. So welfare is a very, very destructive phenomena, very, very destructive activity. Because it, it essentially crushes ambition because yes. there is a safety net there. So then you can be lazy. There's the option to do nothing. The, the, the safety net should be a private safety net. And charities tend to say to people, here's some help while you're struggling, but we're going to help you come out of the struggling. We're going to help you find a job. We're going to help you get yourself established. The government doesn't do that. The government has an incentive keep people down, to keep people dependent on the government. So, uh, Yaron, this is nothing new, is it? Because the Roman Empire did this as well. Uh, because at that time, people were impoverished through battle. There were wars to be fought. And, um, you know, they came back and they said, we have no more money. And the ruling parties said, well, I'll lend you the money. Because if you loan people money, you'll always have poor people. You'll always have debt slaves. So nobody rises. So it's not yep, the fault right. of the it's not the fault of the one percent or people who are successful and innovative. Well, it's, it's the fault of the one percent to the extent that they support governments like this, hmm. right? This it's the support of the one percent of the only of the people who actually create the jobs for everybody else. But to the extent that the one percent support politicians who then establish a welfare state and support a massive distribution of wealth, to that extent they are to blame. But not because of their wealth. Their wealth creates jobs, creates wealth, raises people up from poverty. The only system in human history to raise people out of poverty is capitalism. It's the system that creates the 1%. A, a feature of that system is to help people come out of poverty. And the, other, the argument that you hear from the other side is that when you have capitalism, it leaves a whole bunch of other people behind. But is that true? Because very no. few people... What happens is yeah. the inequality increases, hmm. but everybody, everybody's better off. I mean, except the lazy bum, right? Yeah. The lazy bum is worse off under capitalism because in, in socialism, he gets a check from the government. But if you're willing to work... Capitalism makes your life better. It doesn't make your life better in an equal way to everybody else, but it makes your life better than the alternative. You have the best life possible to you as an individual. And what do you think of uh, universal basic income, this idea that when the automation comes, when the robotic workforce is fully deployed, probably in about 10 years' time, a lot of people are going to be without a job. It's not because they're not thinking or not because they're lazy. It's just there won't be a job because a robot can do it much more efficiently and better. So what is your opinion of universal basic income? So I'm against any kind of redistribution of wealth, and I'm certainly against the universal basic income, which is paying people not to work. I don't believe the robot story. I, this is the story that I've heard for 250 years from the, from the, from the invention of the first mechanized sewing machine or, or mechanized anything. We've heard it over and over and over again. Oh, there are not going to be any jobs, but there are always more jobs after than before. Robots are going to create jobs, many, many jobs, different jobs than what they are today. If you have a job today that a robot could do instead of you, Start thinking about how to retrain, start thinking about changing your focus, start thinking about where job opportunity is going to be in the future. But the idea that there are going to be fewer jobs is absurd. Human needs are infinite. There's always more stuff that we're going to want. 
there's always more things, more products, more services, more, uh, 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 you know, uh, I don't know. Do you know how many nail salons there are in California? <laughs> A lot. I mean, millions. Yeah. Every strip mall has a nail salon. How many nail salons existed in California 30 years ago? Almost none. It's a whole industry that has just sprung out of nowhere the last 40 years. Now, could I predict that industry? No. Can I predict now what the industries of 40 years from now are going to be? No. But there's always jobs. The gaming industry, computer gaming. Yes, yes. Programming for games. Hundreds of thousands of people work at program very high paid. Nobody could have predicted that. Yeah. So what are going to be the industries from 30, 40 years from now? I don't know. But if you're in an industry that can be replaced by a robot in the next 10 years, then you should think about retraining yourself. Yes. And you're on, in the time we have left remaining, could you talk about some of your other books besides Equal is Unfair and uh, your most recent one that came out? Yeah, so my first book, uh, my first book with the same co-author with Don Watkins was uh, Free Market Revolution, How Ayn Rand's Ideas Can End Big Government. And it's a book about how capitalism works and how capitalism is the solution to almost all the problems we have today. Equal is Unfair addresses this issue of, of in, is inequality a problem? And, and it shows the evil of equality and that inequality is a good thing because it is a feature of freedom. When it is a feature of freedom, it's a good thing. And then my, my latest book is called Wealth Creators, The Moral Case for Finance, and it articulates the case for finance as a moral, productive, innovative, and crucial industry for any growing economy. So it presents financiers as heroes. And they're not evil finance guys, right? They're not evil. Heroes. They're the good guys. They make possible all the wealth that we have around us. And tell us a little bit about JP Morgan then. <laughs> <laughs> well, JP Morgan is a relatively good bank that actually did pretty well during the financial crisis. Yeah. To the extent that JP Morgan has bad stuff happening, it's because it is one of the most regulated institutions in the world. It has over 100 people working at JP Morgan at the bank, uh, at JP Morgan Chase at the bank every day who work for the government but have offices at JP Morgan. Uh, and uh, its primary product, money, is controlled by the Federal Reserve. So it's not a free company in a free market. It is a highly, highly, highly regulated company in a highly, highly, highly regulated uh, environment. So your preference would be that there would be absolutely no regulations, right? Because the market has these natural checks. The, 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 the role of the government is to protect us from fraud and crooks and criminals who steal from us and cheat us. But other than that, leave us alone. And what should one do about this welfare issue then? Is it just going to continue in increasing in numbers? Because it's quite Well, it's going to continue increasing in numbers unless we fight it. So we have to fight it. And ultimately, we have to defund it. And we have to encourage, uh, we have to create the jobs. We have to create an economy that creates jobs and move people to a work um, you know, mindset away from an entitlement mindset. Okay, and I think that's the crux of the problem. It's not entitlement. People are not entitled to other people's pie. Okay, there's you no don't collective have a pie. Right to my stuff. <laughs> that's right. Okay, and uh, that's all the time we have. Unfortunately, you're on for this show. But thank you for being my guest on both Outside In and We Like the One Percent. And I hope to see you again sometime soon. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us, and I'll see you next week. Aloha.